One of the biggest uh, issues that we're facing and, and we think a lot about and talk a lot about and work on quite a bit is the area of antibiotic resistance in healthcare associated infections. And antibiotic resistance has, has been an increasing problem there. And that, of course, does pertain a lot to biofilms and this whole issue of biofilms and healthcare associated infections, or HAIs, I'll refer, them, refer to them as HAIs throughout my discussion today, is a big area. Um, part of it leads into the discussion of biofilms so much because so much of resistance in healthcare settings is generated by uh, the use of antibiotics to treat uh, biofilms or infections caused by biofilms, which are inherently, of course, as you know, inherently resistant to treatment. And it leads to prolonged exposure of these organisms to antibiotics, sometimes sub-inhibitory concentrations of antibiotics. This is a big area, and so it's very pertinent to the issue of biofilms and certainly pertinent to what we do. We develop evidence-based guidelines uh, for the development of prevention strategies. Um, and we really, um, at CDC, we have the only healthcare associated infection uh, prevention guidelines from the federal government. There are certainly other guidelines coming from professional organizations, but we are the guideline writers for uh, the federal government in this area. Uh, we also then work on the implementation of these known prevention strategies via collaboration between both the public health infrastructure and the healthcare delivery system, so hospitals, working with hospitals. Uh, more and more, we're working with state health departments and local health departments to help them as they work with hospitals and other healthcare uh, uh, delivery systems to implement what we know is, is proven prevention strategies. Um, we um, also then do conduct research to improve res uh, um, prevention strategies and even devise new prevention strategies. Our research was really focused in this area of epidemiologic and laboratory research that sometimes is the first to come up with a new prevention strategy. Well, really, uh, biofilms are a major part of all of our major infections. Uh, we have long focused on the device and procedure associated infections. The device associated infections that are most common are central line associated uh, bloodstream infection. These are associated with a central venous catheter, usually placed in the subclavian and their neck. Um, to administer IV medications and whatnot. These have a propensity for becoming infected and almost always involve a biofilm when they do. Uh, Ventilator-associated pneumonia involves the insertion of an endotracheal tube into the trachea. Um, those also involve biofilms when uh, infections develop. These are pneumonias usually that develop. Uh, Catheter-associated urinary tract infection. Um, sometimes abbreviated as CAUTI, um, also associated with biofilms on those catheters. And then the surgical site infections, uh, especially those associated with prosthetic devices are almost always associated with a biofilm. So we've been working seriously to prevent those. Uh, I'll just highlight some of those. Um, um, the SSIs, the surgical site infections, certainly, we are even increasing our focus on those that are most biofilm related as, as we go forward into producing more uh, uh, updated guidelines, we'll be focusing more on preventing infections associated with uh, arthroplasties and the um, uh, placement of uh, prosthetic joints. Um, there's, of course, other bioprosthetic and uh, even tissue transplants, that when they become infected, can also be associated with biofilms, and our division also deals with those infections. Um, there are some other biofilm-related uh, infections that are healthcare-associated that we probably have not been as focused on to date, and I think, we, Richard, we, we've talked about those before, like some of the diabetic foot infections. Uh, those are not always clearly associated with some uh, lapse in patient safety, but they certainly develop in people who are under the care of healthcare providers. Uh, those chronic wounds, chronic leg ulcers all uh, involve uh, biofilms. Uh, and of course, pressure ulcers also. Uh, pressure ulcers, the prevention of pressure ulcers is certainly uh, a big uh, initiative from the federal government um, across our sister agencies. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services is certainly very interested in preventing these, as is the Agency for Health Research and Quality, ARC. Um, we do not have that as our primary mission to prevent the ulcers, but I think certainly into the future, looking at the prevention of infection of those ulcers will be important. Our uh, current estimate of the total burden is, is 
often quoted as around 1.7 million healthcare-associated infections annually. Uh, these were based upon some estimates that date back to 2000, a publication, uh, well, actually uh, date back to data from 2002. From those estimates, we um, believe there's around 300,000 uh, or 290,000 surgical site infections annually, uh, around uh, 50 to 100,000 catheter-associated bloodstream infections, uh, 50,000 or so ventilator-associated pneumonias. Uh, and uh, we've estimated in the past uh, 450,000 catheter-associated uh, urinary tract infections. Well, the good news of these estimates, as I've mentioned, is they do deal with these devices and procedures. Um, uh, the shortcoming I've mentioned already, they're somewhat outdated. Another shortcoming is that they're really focused on those that are a hospital onset, and that's been traditionally where we've focused a lot of our uh, measurement and prevention. More and more, though, we're understanding that more of these have these uh, more of these infections have their onset in the community, but are healthcare associated, uh, and so we're going to in the future be getting better estimates of those. Um, it, it, it may be very substantial, the number of infections that are occurring in the community. For bloodstream infections, for some like, uh, for example, MRSA bloodstream infections caused by the methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, it looks like about half of them uh, total uh, are occurring in the community but are, are healthcare associated. So these are people recently discharged or getting care in uh, dialysis clinics and things. Often biofilm, these are catheter-associated bloodstream infections, so they're biofilm related, certainly. Uh, the catheter-associated urinary tract infections could definitely be uh, chronic and low-grade. In fact, many of them are. If It depends upon how long the pa patients have been catheterized. And it's, it's interesting you bring that up, Richard, because there's certain uh, populations where catheter-associated urinary tract infection is much higher. We've been seeing recently that in some of the rehab uh, units. Uh, these are patients with much longer catheterization times um, that they have much higher rates. And so those are probably very, even when they're not actively, do not appear actively infected, they may well have some chronic infection ongoing. Uh, for the catheter-associated bloodstream infections, we think that most of those are pretty acute infections. They usually manifest as fever, sometimes even sepsis, and or, or local acute infection. Uh, again, also probably true with the ventilator-associated pneumonias. The surgical site infections, most of those are going to be acute infections that present within 30 days. The exception there also, though, is some of the prosthetic implant-associated infections, where we actually, as a surveillance definition, try to track those out for a year after implantation. So they definitely can be chronic infections that then finally um, become uh, there's, there's a clinical awareness of them and, and then they're diagnosed finally. So there's a mix there. Uh, biofilms and surveillance definitions. For catheter-associated bloodstream infection, uh, it's pretty good. I mean, um, most of the most serious infections result in positive blood cultures. So patients have a central line, a central line in place. They develop a fever. Blood cultures are the common practice in, in that situation and usually a biofilm that's resulting in serious infection will result in positive blood cultures. The exception sometimes can be on people on antibiotics and it can be problematic. Now, um, for site infections, you see redness, you see pus, and that's also pretty, it's a clinical definition for the central line associated infection. There has been also the practice of using uh, a catheter tip culture. We don't include that in our surveillance definition. It's really a um, added tool for the clinical diagnosis. Um, and really that has been mainly to try to differentiate whether uh, a bloodstream infection with positive blood cultures is caused by the catheter or caused by some other site infection. We basically say that if someone has positive blood cultures and they have a central venous catheter in place and they have no other obvious source of infection, we call that uh, a catheter-associated bloodstream infection. So for surveillance, that's that's how we make that definition. There can be people who have an um, an implant. Uh, we're talking here a joint implant often, and they may have loosening, and this may even occur years out, beyond our year of of definition, and. 
there is some recent literature, as you know, that, that when you go in and, and do a revision on those patients, they have no overt signs of infection, that some of them may have a component of biofilm infection found through molecular uh, techniques. I think that uh, certainly more research needs to be done in that area before we could make that as part of a surveillance definition. I think that brings up some other innovative ways to conduct surveillance though too because that probably is after several years and, and that presents a challenge and we can talk about that also. In the chronic setting, to detect that there is an infection versus a mechanical problem, other markers. And, and when I'm talking about other serologic markers, you know, we know about the C-reactive protein, which has some place that used to be the sedimentation rate. We looked at a lot. There are other things like um, uh, precalcitonin, other markers that have been looked at too. But I, I think basically that, that requires some additional research in the area of clinical diagnosis. That's not our, our sweet spot. Our sweet spot will be when better diagnostic methods come out. And we can be a part of that certainly at CDC and, and help fund some of that work and our partners can, certainly other agencies. Uh, but then when some of that gets into the guidelines and then we could, we could have that in the guidelines for diagnosis, of these infections and then tracking those infections would be another thing that CDC would be very interested.